reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way of the Red, to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's little food, no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the sand, son of man, be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord, uphold thou me that I might uplift thee. Amen. Lent is a good time for making confessions. So I am going to confess something to you. I lied recently, not to any of you, to my dentist. (laughs) Not about how often I floss, I told the truth about that. See, this was a new dentist for me, and when she came in, she was super friendly, a little too friendly for my taste. And she started interrogating me with all of these very personal questions like, where am I from? And did I have a nice holiday? But it was when she asked me what I did for a living that I began to panic. You see, when I am feeling vulnerable, on my back, literally under a microscope, I prefer to be as anonymous as possible. And sometimes when you tell someone you're an ordained minister, you don't know what the reaction is gonna be. Most people just 
you know, apologize for any curse words they may have said earlier in the conversation. <laughs> and I promise you, we don't care. <laughs> But then they try to just get away as quickly as possible, right? But not always, and you never know. Are they going to unload all of their grievances about organized religion on you? <laughs> or are they going to unload all of their burdens on you and expect you to be pastoral while your mouth is getting poked with sharp objects? <laughs> or are they going to judge you for the hypocrisy of supposedly being an ethical person, but also having a cavity? <laughs> and yes, I know that a cavity is not a moral failing, but does my dentist know that? <laughs> so anyway, she asked me and I just froze. And then without really thinking it through, I blurted out, I'm a teacher. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a total lie. <laughs> Teaching is part of my ministry. And I guess I thought this was generic and common enough that she would just say, oh, that's nice and move on. <laughs> but she did not move on. She wanted to know what I teach and where I teach and how long have I taught. And so at this point, I had a choice, right? I could either just go ahead and fess up and admit my true vocation, or I could dig myself deeper into the lie. What do you think I chose? <laughs> exactly right. I mumbled something about teaching religious studies to preschoolers or, or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and I kind of blacked out at that point. Eventually the interrogation stopped. She started looking at my mouth. And after making it 42 years without a single cavity, she then proceeds to tell me that I have three and we'll need to come back two more times. <laughs> So when this appointment was over, I came to two important conclusions. First, clearly the cavities were my punishment from God for blatantly lying <laughs> to this kind-hearted, overly inquisitive healthcare provider. And two, it's time to find a different dentist. <laughs> Someone who is disinterested and aloof, who will just attend to my teeth with very little curiosity about the person they belong to. So if you have any names, let me know after church. But okay, so now that you know the truth about me and my deceitful ways, and you have some insight into my personal brand of depravity. Let's look at what the scripture readings for today have to say on the matter. We start with the, the story about Moses and the bronze serpent. And this has got to be one of the most bizarre stories in the Hebrew Bible. And just to review, um, here's what has happened. The, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And then... Moses is called by God to lead them out of captivity into freedom. But before they can arrive at the land of promise, they wander in the desert for 40 years. And it is hard, that wilderness journey. Way harder than they expected, and they get cranky. And they become erroneously nostalgic for Egypt and slavery. And they complain about everything. They say things like, there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Which is like me opening my very full closet and saying, ugh, I have nothing to wear. God has provided for them all along the way, has provided food and water, but they're tired and worried and stressed, and so they lose perspective and they turn to complaining, and I feel for them. 
It would have been terrifying out there in that wilderness. Scarce resources, very little protection from danger. Um, And danger does crop up, right? In, In the story today, we heard that some of their number have been getting bitten by venomous snakes and, and have died, right? So this is serious. They have every right to be fearful. And their response is understandable. They are trying to make sense of a situation that does not make sense. And so they begin to draw some theological conclusions, right? We've been complaining against God, and now we're experiencing these tragedies, so clearly these two things must be connected, right? They make assumptions just like that assumption I made in the dentist chair, right? I lied to the dentist, therefore the cavities must be my punishment from God. Um, So they, they assume that their complaining and their hardships are related, right? That the latter was connected, is connected to the former, caused by the former. And they assume, like many of us do, whether we're aware of it or not, that the difficult things happening to them must be God's punishment for their sins. It's a very human response. It is a way to try to make sense out of something that does not make sense. What did I do to cause this dreadful thing to happen to me? Now, I imagine God is used to us doing this, right? This is, again, a very human thing to do. And so God is used to us blaming bad things on divine retribution, is probably not very shocked by these assumptions we like to make, um, nor is God shocked that they end up in the Bible. God is not shocked by the emotions that go along with these assumptions, our anger, our despair, whatever it is, God's big enough to handle all of that, Um, even our less than gracious emotions. And even when we make God out to be in the punishment business and erroneously blame our problems on what we assume is God's wrath. But anyway, after the Israelites have made their assumptions about the source and the reason for the snakes, they apologize. They feel bad, right? And so they apologize and they ask God to take away the serpents. And God hears them. God listens to their petitions. God hears their prayers just as God hears us when we pray. God hears us when we beg for mercy, for intervention, right? When we say things like, God, take away these hardships. It is too much. Deliver me from this pain, from this grief, from this fear. All of this is a a near universal desire, right? To be delivered from the things that are hard. And even Jesus himself experienced that emotion When he says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. That's what he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. So it's it's normal, it's human, right? Now, the Israelites, of course, they beg for the snakes to be taken away. Remember, they are assuming that God was the one who put the snakes there in the first place. And so it follows that God could make them disappear again if they ask nicely. So God hears all this, hears their grief, hears their fear, and responds. And here's where the story gets really bizarre. God responds to this plea, but not by doing what they ask God to do, right? Deliverance rarely happens in the way we expect it to or think it should. God does not remove the snakes from the wilderness like they asked. Instead, God tells Moses to take an image of the thing that they are fearing, right? A snake, and then hold it up for everyone to see. Hold it up in the light. At God's instruction, Moses fashions a bronze snake and installs it up high on a pole. And the way this was gonna work was if the snake bite victims can bear to face the likeness of the creature that has bit them, they will be healed. 
what is God up to here? We see that the, you know, the people's request to have the snakes just vanquished is not realized. The snakes remain, the bites keep coming. God's response may not resemble the solution they envisioned, but they do receive a means of healing and deliverance. Sometimes healing does not look like what we planned or wanted, but healing does happen in different ways. Sometimes healing can only happen by facing the very thing that plagues you in the first place. Just like a vaccine, right, often includes some element of the illness that it is designed to fight. In the wilderness, we see that the snake on a stick becomes the antidote to snake bites. Sometimes the cure is found in the ailment itself. It's not logical, doesn't make sense to us maybe, not self-evident, but sometimes healing is peculiar and mysterious. And moreover, sometimes God is peculiar and mysterious. So the snake on a stick incident was strange, um, but how's this for strange? Many years after Moses and all of those snake-bitten Israelites were long gone, a man comes along, another man, and he turned out to be the most peculiar and mysterious thing God ever did, because he was, in fact, God. His mission was to love people and to heal people, even sinful, lying, constantly complaining people. His mission was to love them and heal them, And those healings rarely happen just the way the people thought they would or should. But he loved people and he healed them and he delivered them from what held them captive. And it turned out what they most needed deliverance from was their captivity to death. And so this peculiar and mysterious man offered a solution to their ailment of dying. He took their affliction and found a way to overcome it via his own death. He died so that death would not have the final word with them. His own death became the antidote to death. As the Book of Common Prayer puts it um, in the Easter Eucharistic prayer, by his death, he has destroyed death. It was not the solution that anyone expected, but deliverance rarely happens in the ways we expect. A snake was the cure for the snakes in the desert, and a death is the cure for death. It is strange and mysterious and peculiar and wonderful that God died so that we would not have to face our own deaths, consumed with fear that there's nothing else for us beyond the grave, or consumed with worry about the eternal repercussions of that time we lied to our dentist and any other sins we may have committed. Because our God is not a God of punishment and wrath. Because our God is a God of grace and mercy and healing and love. Amen.